Secret of Dreaming, uh, which is a new show here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. So the Bull and Rocco show, always very interesting. Uh, you know, they're always doing their legal their legal wars, as we call them, and, um, you know, fighting the good fight as the regular guy, just trying to, you know, stand up for their rights and, and do the right thing. So. Good. Okay, so Michael Hemmingson will oh. be hosting the Art of Dreaming, uh, a brand new show here on Revolution Radio, everyone. Okay. Uh, so keep your eyes uh, open and your eye and your ears even more open, as uh, <laughs> exactly. as, as I'll be doing myself because I'm I'm interested to, to see how the Art of Dreaming can be used uh, to better ourselves, ultimately. Um, because apparently, uh, apparently there's also Tammy Sutton. She's also the co-host. So it's Mike Hemmingson and Tammy Sutton, uh, our hosts for The Art of Dreaming. And uh, sorry to interrupt. And also, where's our break? I mean, where's the top of the hour break? It's a little late, isn't it? Go ahead. I, it, might, it might actually be going in the background and we're not hearing it. Huh. Ever, ever, ever have that happen to you? <laughs> no. No, uh, okay, so that's very interesting. Well, I want to go ahead and like sign off, but I don't want to leave any dead air, so I'm not quite sure. Uh, Painter, are you around? Somebody help us out here. I just want to make sure that uh, the new show starts. Uh, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Is this thing on? Did I did I did I uh, just uh, mute myself and had a little rant there without you hearing me? Yes, I did, and we did, and it did, and. Okay, yeah, I guess we're still on the air. So Yeah, we are on the air, but uh, I don't see anything <laughs> lined up in terms of um in terms of uh um uh, uh, like a cap for the show, you know, like a promo for the show. Huh. Very interesting. Well, we can sit here and twiddle our thumbs or I can, you know, basically read another article until we figure out what the heck's going on. Twiddle our thumbs? No, no we never do that here. <laughs> Well, I know, but I don't. I don't want to sit here and be like. Ur, 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 ur. <laughs> so um, I don't know. Is, uh, Painter, can you help us out? Are you listening? Do you have access to? Yeah. Okay, I got to drop it. And he's going to grab it. Okay, everyone. Thanks so much for listening. Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com. Peter Petrov. Always a pleasure. See you tomorrow. See you, baby. Check, check. Dead. Okay, folks. I'm not sure what's going on. We'll try and get it. Okay, folks, I think I got it now. We'll get get Michael in here. I'm are you, here. Michael, are you there? Yes, I'm here. Right, where, there you go, bro. You're on here. <laughs> I don't know what I, happened. Uh, no music? No, nah, I don't know what happened. Something happened with the with the auto, but you're on live now. Uh, if you um, want to pass you, your contact details for your oh. co-host, I'll bring him in. But she, she um, uh, added Freedom Screen. Tammy Sutton? I don't know if it's been transferred to me or not. Uh, you got her contact details and put them in the bottom of the chat here, and I can grab her. Okay. Or you can try adding her, and when it fails, I can call her back. That'll work, too. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm actually using my uh, iPhone, and uh, I can't – here, let me um, – can she add you, a mad painter? Yeah. She can add me. That'll work, too. It's just straight a mad painter, all in little letters. Okay. Uh, well, we don't want any dead air here. So this is the inaugural show of The Art of Dreaming. Not about literal dreaming. The, the, the title comes from uh, Carlos Castaneda. Like my, my Saturday show is called A Separate Reality, which is uh, – Castaneda's second book, and he had another book called The Art of Dreaming. So I thought I would follow that um, that that sort of theme, that motif. Um, the idea, I mean, it, the this show surrounding dreaming, the theme of dreaming is going to be a broad expanse. It could be, you know, our literal dreams, what our dreams mean, uh, you know, aliens and angels and whatnot contacting contacting us in our dreams, as well as chasing and following dreams, whatever those dreams are. And for this first show, Tammy Sutton and I will be talking about chasing the Hollywood dream, since the two of us uh, have worked to varying degrees of success and failures <laughs> of working in Hollywood and TV and films and all that stuff. Are you on, Tammy? No, I don't hear her yet. Um, 
She uh, has to. She, I've got her, but she has to come online for me to pull her in. Uh, oh, she's not online. Not yet. She's. I've got her as a contact, but it's showing her offline. I can't pull her in until she comes online. Okay. Well, anyway, uh, until we get her online, um, I just wanted to talk. I'll, I'll talk about the subject more. On. All right. Here comes the intro now. Okay. Again, with the art of dreaming, with Michael Hemmingson, and my guest co-host today is Tammy Sutton. Are you there, uh, Tammy? Yet? I haven't been able to bring her in for some reason. Uh, is she on a phone? No, she's on a. I think she's on an i iPad. Uh, she'll have to call in then. Okay. Because it's not letting me pull her in for some reason, and now she's got a number I can call her at. I can do that too. There, uh, there, there. She's trying to come in now. Okay. Gotta love live radio. Oh yeah. <laughs> we don't want any. Uh, uh, hey guys. There you are. <laughs> Technology. Yeah. Works. Uh, and, and you're on. You're on an iPad, right? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm on an iPhone. Strangely enough. Because I I'm at a friend's place and and I, I couldn't get on their computer and the the uh, the the wireless was iffy so I couldn't get on my computer but I figured it out on my new nifty iPhone which I got two days ago 
Not that this is an ad for, for Apple, but I'm just saying. Hey, if they want to send us a check or free products that I use all the time, I'd be happy to take it. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, any Apple people listening out there, we, we will review your products if you send them to us. <laughs> so the, the, the art of dreaming, as, as I was saying before, that really cool and spooky music came on, um, it comes from a, a book. The title comes from a book by Carlos Castaneda. My Saturday show I call Separate Reality, which also comes from Castaneda. Not that we're going to be delving into Castaneda. I was just appropriating the titles and, and the general motif and theme. So, yeah, uh, for this Wednesday show, we will, I will, we will talk about uh, literal dreaming, you know, our dreams, what they mean, uh, aliens, angels, and, and whatever, reptoids ending our dreams and trying to give us messages and uh, uh, predicting the future, as well as uh, uh, chasing your dreams, which we're going to focus on that. Today, Tammy and I will talk about chasing the Hollywood dream, which uh, millions of people all over dream about and do. Uh, Tammy and I have both worked in, in, in the Hollywood uh, game with various amounts of success and failures, which, which we'll be talking about soon here. Um, but, but first, to start off, I want to – I'm not going to get political that much on this show, but, and I'll talk about this a little bit more in um, – Saturday, but uh, there's something about Obama that's bugging me that I, I have to talk about. Um, last week in New Jersey, when they were having a, a, a contest contesting the, uh, his eligibility for the, for the um, primary ballots, his, his lawyer, uh, Alexandria Hill, had actually in court admitted that the birth certificate on the White House website is indeed a fraud. They admitted it was a fraud. However, she found a loophole because the whole issue with, with, with whether he's uh, eligible to be in the White House or not is something that's, that the Supreme Court and the Senate is going to have to take up because it's a constitutional matter. Since the, uh, the uh, natural born citizen uh, regulation is in the Constitution, only, only a constitutional uh, uh, legal venue such as the Supreme Court or, or the U.S. The U.S. courts can can hear that, but since they were in a state administrative judge court, uh, only hearing matters on on eligibility for for um, a primary ballot and regular ballot, that the point is mute. The only, as she argued, the only uh, um, matter at issue was was the laws concerning New Jersey state uh, primary ballot, which is. Um, all he had to have X amount of signatures, I don't know, it was 1,500 or whatever, and pay the fee. And that's it. So legally, they're right, because the judge just yesterday ruled that, that Obama could stay on the primary ballot. Um, and so, but the thing is, and we're not seeing it in, on the major news media, that Obama's lawyer actually admitted that the birth certificate is a fake, which to some of us, that, that's, that's, you know, not a surprise. Um, but however, she was also saying that Obama, since he didn't do it, he, and this is what he's going to say, I bet, once he gets out. He's going to say, oh, well, my people did it. Uh, I uh, obviously hired the wrong people. Uh, they, they, they didn't find the right birth certificate. I'm, I'm not at fault here. You know, the same sort of argument that Clinton, you know, said, oh, I didn't have sex with her. And the same with Ronald Reagan, you know, when they had the uh, uh, Iran-Contra uh, court hearings. You know, uh, Reagan just pretended, oh, I'm an old man. I, 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 I don't remember. So uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, what, what, what they say about it. And I'll talk about this more in depth on Saturday, but let's, uh, let's get back to Hollywood here. Um, well, Tammy, why, why, don't you, why don't you give your intro about what, what you do and, and your productions and all that stuff? Uh, first, got to mention I'm a huge toy collector, and I love the new Baracula action toy from the uh, Presidential Monster set. I, I, I haven't seen that. You've got an action, action figure? Oh, yeah, it's a set of them. It's um, Heroes and Action Make Them. They also made a really good Lincolnstein <laughs> and, a Nick, and a Nixon creature from the Watergate Lagoon. <laughs> uh, I'll have to check that out. I haven't seen those. Yeah, they're great. So um, I'm a writer, director, and producer, and an executive producer. I make films. I came from the horror background, but um, getting further and deeper into your dreams, you know, the passion projects come up, and I definitely have those. And the, they're a little bit politically charged, so we might be on the right track for both sh shows. 
Um, where do you want to start? What, 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 could you tell us, I mean, I know, but could you tell us out there what, what's the difference between a producer and an executive producer? Um, producers, and then there, there's line producers that actually do the, the day-to-day footwork, um, actually when you're filming on set, um, basically running the crew. And a producer is someone who basically fosters the project, usually from development or um, from the beginning when a film's previous to being financed and when it's financed basically overseeing the entire project all the way through the entire production and distribution generally. Um, And an executive producer is someone who actually invests or um, manages the investment to get films funded and to actually make the dreams come true. So, So the executive producer is the money man, money woman. Yes. Yeah. Or so, the person, or the person, um, you know, hired by an investor who's not a producer to to basically micromanage the entire project. Right, and yeah, I know I've known executive producers either they put up the money themselves and just get the title executive producer for for that, or uh, or the or the the go betweens between between investors or a bank. You know, if you get a bank to invest in your film. Oh, absolutely. I mean the. Producer credits are thrown around all the time in Hollywood. If, if you're um, if you're interested in investing in films or you know being involved in films, and you're looking at people, definitely check their credits. You know, see w- and ask questions. Ask them exactly how you know why did you get an executive producer credit or you know a, a producing credit? Because there are so there's a lot of people out there too that call themselves producers that you know don't ever go on set and don't actually deal with producing a film. I mean, the credits are cheap and free. Well, yeah, I know that, you know, you can get a producer credit for just uh, handing someone a script and the yep. script w- winds up getting made or, or, or just, you know, putting person A and person B into contact with person C. And they go, well, you know, for that, I, I want a producer credit and point zero zero five points, you know, on the Absolutely. film. Absolutely. Right. And, they, and it undermines a lot of the hardworking producers and um, line producers out there that are actually in the trenches that, you know, often get have to share their credit with people that, you know, have done little to nothing to make a project happen. It's frustrating, but, you know, you get to know enough people and, and you figure it out. And, you know, it's part of the, the learning experience you get with being in film. I've been in town like 17 years now and, you know, I've met a lot of producers, you know. Yeah. Well, it also gets you a, a credit on IMDb, you know. Yeah, it's funny because that's a contention. You know, that's something I've been fighting with uh, painstakingly over the years is people that aren't doing anything end up with these awesome IMDb credits, and then people that are working really hard, you know, I'm fighting to get stuff posted or they, they delete stuff or they get it wrong and I can't get it changed. I actually met the guy – who um, created INUB. He's a really sweet guy. I hang out with him in Cannes when I'm there. He's a British bloke. But, of course, he can't. Uh, he has nothing to do with it now. It's all, I, bo- I believe it's Amazon owns it. Oh, okay. I w- I'm not surprised. <laughs> yeah, they're selling movies. Of course they want to run the movie data information. Right. Um, well, I, 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 when I was working on my, my first film, The Watermelon, we, we had brought in a guy to be a producer, he was working on some game show. And once we brought him in, all of a sudden on our, our, our IMDb page, all these little co-producers start popping up. I'm talking about like six of them. And I was like, what, what is going on? And we found out they were all his buddies. He had, he'd told his buddies, I'll put you on as, as a, a co-producer. Yeah. So, so we got rid of that. I mean, I mean, really, I mean, you, you hear people, you hear guys going, God, I need an IMDb credit to to get laid you know <laughs> you go down to the bar and and, and, and show it to people uh, that's embarrassing but true yeah, yeah yeah not for me well no no well, yeah. <laughs> but 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 what do you mean you, you you don't need to show them or you're just not impressed when a guy shows you his his credits oh both but believe me when, <laughs> when people when people direct me to their imdb page i'm like if if we were talking about doing a project together i've already checked your IMDb, and I've already checked the people you've worked with to make sure you actually do what you say you do. Now, do you, do you still do extra work with the TV shows? 
I haven't for a long time, but it's funny. I, I want someone to uh, put together a reel of all the stuff I've I've been in over the years, an extra when I was starving. You know, I was actually producing, you know, feature length films, and you know, I had to supplement my independent income with doing extra work. But it was great because I get to go on the big sets and see how stuff was made. You know, so in the big in the big league, you know, it was nice doing extra work on two hundred fifty dollar, sorry, two hundred fifty million dollar movies. You know, and, and meeting the and seeing the big toys they use, and it, it was all part of the experience. But no, I haven't done any extra work lately. In fact, my last film I miss I didn't do my last few films I did not do a cameo in or a cameo as my friends like to call it. So my uh my work and passion is behind the camera. Okay, oh, I I just got cut off, but I guess you were talking. Uh, uh, I don't know. I can hear oh, you. You can hear me. Uh, I, I accidentally touched the wrong button on my phone. I've got a dog nipping at my feet here. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, you, you you've done. I know that you've done extra work on on pretty much every all the big shows like uh, uh, Law and Order and uh, those shows, right? Yeah, and Spider Man and movies and all kinds of stuff. Yeah, you name it. I've probably did it in, over but I haven't done extra work and and probably I've been full time directing for the last three years. So it's probably been about four years. I think Spider Man three was my last big one. Well that, that that's one way, you know, of people wanting to be directors and producers or whatever. Or even just wanting to be actors. I mean they they, they you can uh make make a partial living uh doing extra work. In fact you could make a, a regular living just doing extra work depending on you know the, the the shooting time, the shooting season of TV shows and and, and various films, and uh, how how well you're uh, there over that central casting agency. Oh, yeah, I, I mean, I definitely recommend it for young people or older people that want to see how TV shows and films are made. It's a great way to get on set and get paid not much, but get paid to be there and and see how things actually work. And then you know, but it's I definitely it's. Very few and far between, I'd say, I'd recommend for young actors that think that that's their, you know, ticket to stardom. It just, the the, num- the numbers are so small and the, those realities that I don't recommend it. But I think it's great for anyone who wants to be on set. It's, it's definitely it's that or, you know, get on set and be a PA. And I'll tell you what, being an extra is a lot easier. <laughs> well, it's, there's also, because I've done the extra work too a long time ago when, when, all those TV shows they used to shoot down in San Diego, like Silk Stockings and 18 Wheels of Justice and Riptide. Um, Great you, shows. It, yeah. And, and, but, you know, if you're doing extra work for shows like that and you just want to make some cash, uh, actually turn down if they get, offer you a, a couple of lines, you know, to say some stuff, because then you have to go sag uh, Screen Actors Guild to, to speak, and then you're going to get less work because there's not always, you know, uh, Availability for a character to say, you know, two words or three words as there is for background. Yeah, but um, they have every SAG show, though, including most, you know, especially TV. And I know this as a producer on my own um, feature films now that there's a certain amount of SAG extras you have to have, even if they don't have speaking parts. And believe me, they get the, the regular day rate, which is annoying to producers doing low budget independent films. But um, right. I, I learned that lesson very well on a film I directed called David and Fatima with Martin Landau and then Tony Curtis. And it was Tony Curtis' last film. But um, SAG slammed me with a ton of SAG extras that I had to have and pay them well. But, you know, I, I believe in paying everyone well when you can. I just don't like when the odd, you know, it's on an uneven stance. Yeah, that's the other thing, too, when you're doing a, a – uh, uh, a film that's within the the unions, all the various unions, you, you have to abide by their rules. You know, who you hire, how many you hire, what you pay them. I think yeah. I think for for actors, isn't the the minimum? What's the minimum? A hundred dollars a day, or hundred an hour? Or? Well, my last two films were in London, so I'm not sure what the. Um, I don't want to misquote it, but you can go to their website; they'll be happy to tell you. Right. So what was the uh, the first first film that you directed? What was it? 
Oh, wow. My first film was at Full Moon, um, and Charlie Ban, who I think I'm the only person that he does not owe money to, um, at Full Good. Moon Entertainment, had a film. He was doing his urban genre films, and he asked me to direct Killjoy 2 because I think nobody else wanted to do it. <laughs> and I had been at the company production designing, producing, just big every job under the sun, uh, Grip Electric. That's how I got into producing, actually, is because I just learned to do everyone's job and would just pick stuff up and be willing to go where they needed me. Um, but he asked me to do it, and I said yes. So Killjoy 2, Killer Clown movie, that's my first first film. Oh, Killer Clowns. <laughs> I've come um, since then. <laughs> So, so what was your last project then? That you uh, did in L- London, right? Yeah, my last project. Um, well, I did two in London in the last two years. My last project that I completed is called Isla Dogs. It's a very nasty, gritty British crime thriller, and we're actually um, doing a U.S. theatrical release here. So I'm really excited, and that's with Andrew um, Howard from. He's in Limitless and The New Ice Pit on Your Grave, and Hangover Two. He's a fantastic actor. And um, the beautiful, gorgeous Barbara Nettle Jacoba from everyone knows from Hostel um, stars in it as well. So we're very excited. And I just got my R rating, which I prayed and prayed for because you really don't want an NC-17. It limits your audience as far as where um, the actual exhibitors, which are the movie theaters, will take you. They don't really want NC-17. And some actually have a no NC-17 policy. So... I prayed really hard to get that R, that hard R. But it's nice because it's a British film, and it was R for bloody violence. So we're so, in the so running. How, how about, can you tell us how how the, the rating system works the, these days anyway? Because uh, I remember, wasn't there, there was a, a, a documentary a couple of years ago about a guy who who uh, tracked down the people who were on, on the board of the, the, the rating board. Yeah, and one of the guys that actually works with me as a distributor is in that documentary. He oh, okay. uh, he also said keep your fingers crossed because he's actually on the board for the NPAA, and he said he just had he he couldn't professionally put good work in for me. And um, and the thing is, is one of the things, and I, I don't want to cut you off, but one of the things that you have to find when you're rating is that you won't discuss it. Um, as far as they don't want you to use your, they don't want you to use it as press. So I guess in this venue we can just talk about it because we're discussing it. But I, I okay. know that I, I can, I know that I can't go out and do a commercial or a trailer on TV that says, "Hey, look, we got a hard R." You know, we love this film because it's so. Uh, it looks like we're on a on a station break there. listening to Revolution Radio. We'll be right back after this short break, so stay tuned. Rebecca Jernigan. Join me and my co-host, Sienna Leah, for Real Women Stepping Up and the Men Who Love Them. Live every Thursday, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern. An interactive, lively, solution-oriented show getting into what real women are about. We explore how to let go of programming to claim our authenticity and divinity. We offer in-depth information and processes for both male and female. Tune in, share, and experience right here on Freedom Slips dot com Thursdays eight to ten PM Eastern. Revolution Revolution Radio. You 
don't see it, do you? How close we are to absolute chaos. The sick ones are sitting on their fat masses, eating and drinking themselves into a stupor, polluting the world without a second thought while it goes down the toilet. Nobody wants to do the nasty work. You know, the shit that we all just think about. Most good citizens are just along for the ride and then bitch and moan and complain about everything when it doesn't work out. Not me. Get it done. Revolution Radio, where we do the nasty work. www.freedomslips.com This is Thomas, a.k.a. a mad painter. I'd like you to join me Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Open Canvas. Don't forget to bring an open mind. Yes, folks, that's right. Bring an open mind to an open canvas. Again, that is Monday nights, 10 p.m. Eastern. You oppose government corruption. This is Revolution Radio, freedomslips.com. You don't need to expect us. We're already here. Thanks for listening while we take that short break here at Revolution Radio, FreedomSlips.com. And yeah, we're going to get back to your host. And we're back. Uh, you still there, Tammy? Oh, yeah. Okay. That was our, our station break. I, I, I thought they were out every top of the hour, but they're, they're every half hour. So wh- where were we? What were you we talking about? Um, um, your, your, oh, your most recent film. Yeah, so um, Isle of Dogs is coming out in theaters soon. I don't have a date yet, but we're uh, working on that. And we're very, very excited. It won um, the Best Feature Film Thriller Film Award at Shriekfest this year, or oh, sorry, yeah. in October. So that was very exciting um, to bring it back to um, California, to Hollywood, to um, not only my friends, but my peers and um, fans. And, you know, I didn't realize what an audience film it was. And so I sat in the audience and watched it with them. And I actually sat in the back with some fans who didn't know, or some, you know, horror fans that didn't know that I was the director. So I got to hear them, like, whispering through the movie and people's reactions. And it was a really, I was over the moon because I was sweating it going into it. But they really loved it. And um, we won the award. So very proud of that. And I'm really excited to bring it to, um, you know, a bigger, wider American audience. What, what was the t- title again? Isle of Dogs. Isle of Dogs. And, and will it have a theatrical release or just video? Yeah. Or? No, we're yeah. going to do a theatrical U.S. release. Cool. But you don't have any, a, a time date? And no, I don't like have that? a date yet, but I'll definitely keep you up to speed. And I shot another one in June called Whispers with um, the beautiful, most most guys know her, um, Keely Hazel from FHM and Maxim and all the magazines. Um, she Wonderful actress, and also um, starring Craig Reese and Phil Polcat, and again um, Barbara Nettle Jacoba. She's a great actress. I love her. I want to use her as much stuff as I can. I really enjoy working with her. And um, we shot that out in Devon, out in the countryside, and um, in a big Victorian manor house. It was a beautiful film. So we're actually just now. Um, we had some, you know, financial difficulties, and um, now we're getting back to finally to getting into post. So um, that'll make the cast and crew happy, and myself, most importantly. And looking forward to editing that and getting all the work done and getting it scored. And um, I'm talking to Peter Murphy from Bauhaus. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah he's um, he. Lo- we're we're talking about a bunch of projects, but he definitely wants to do um, some acting with me. He's a great actor. He's in the, the new Twilight series. Um, but he's also a composer. He's been working with Trent Reznor, and um, he's going to work with Tim Polcat, who scored my last film, to um, probably do some stuff on Whiskers. Or Whispers, not Whiskers. 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 Hey. <laughs> um, I'm watching too many cartoons lately. Um, so, yeah, so um, I'm excited to have Peter Murphy come on and do some music with um, the talents of Tim Polcat again. And um, but I'm really excited, too. My big dream project, the one that's political and taking years and every dime, that one's coming up that um, I want to talk about. Oh, okay. Um, 
I'm directing an upcoming film about World War II. It's a politically charged, but it's about the German POWs that were here in the camps during the war. And it's called My oh. Prison. I've been talking about it for years, right? Yeah, I remember. I think you gave me the script to look at, too. If I remember. Yeah, um, the script's great. The amazing writer of the story is Carl Ames. And um, I found that many American people just don't believe it or are shocked to find out that at a point in World War II, that there were more German prisoner, prisoners, soldiers in the U.S. than actual American soldiers. I mean, I think this film's extremely important, and many stories are still need to be told from World War II. You know, it was just... We have history lessons that we still need to be learned that can be achieved by visiting our past. And, you know, most people watch movies as opposed to reading books. Um, so we've been working on getting this made for a few years now, and it's finally coming into the home stretch. Um, but m my life as a filmmaker, you know, people always ask me simple – they want simple answers to really difficult questions. They're like, well, how did you get to be involved in what you're doing today and – you know, how does that work as a filmmaker? And just alone on this project, my exhaustive research on the subject has taken me all over the world. I mean, I, I literally signed up for the British film because I wanted to be close to Europe and obviously in England to um, really buckle down and get into visiting these places and, and meeting people that have, you know, experienced their lives in World War II. Um, it was just an uncanny experience. I mean, I spent the last three years going all over Europe and Eastern Europe and Central Europe and England. And um, these people's stories resonate the same sentiment as modern day soldiers and the war torn residents have. Um, there's actually a great tour company called beyond the band of brothers tour. And they go mm. on these, they go on these world war two historical trips that just go to the beaches of Normandy, Hitler's Eagle's nest. They do the Holocaust tours but I mean, I, just, I stood at Brandenburg Gate in Berlin and just knew that the, the, my passion for this film was, it, you know, that I just couldn't let go of this. And it's, you know, I've had tons of meetings with producers, executive producers, financiers, and, you know, be, because, you know, of the, the German issues, there's a lot, there's many Hollywood producers that wouldn't touch it. I took it to Germany. I took it to Rome. Um and funny enough, I got the most love in Rome with uh, the Germans loved it as well. But um, in Rome, I met with um, took me two years to buckle him down on meetings. But I met with him twice last year in Rome. Um, uh, Enzo Sisti, who's the executive producer of The American, which I love, the George Clooney film that kind of didn't get as much love as I thought it should. Um, and he also did Passion of the Christ. has really fostered me and, and been a great mentor. Um, so when people see me, you know, they see my Facebook page and they see that I've been going to Europe and I'm traveling and doing all this stuff. And they actually, you know, go, oh, well, she's jet setting. She's out spending all the money she's making, making films. That's absolutely not true. I'm, I'm not jet setting. I'm, we call it easy jet setting because that's the cheap airline in Europe where you get $50 <laughs> flights from London to Rome or wherever. Right. Excuse me. You said you had a Facebook. Could you uh, yell out the link for people? Yeah, it's, it's my real name. It's Tammy Sutton. And uh, my name is T-A-M-M-I, and I got lots of room for new friends. And, um, you know, I've, I'm an avid photographer as well. You know, I try to document my life as well as possible. And, you know, I can't always talk about stuff on Facebook of specific things that have to do with projects. And I'm not looking for projects for people to send me. i got a stack of stuff to do for the next several years. Um, but I definitely... I'm interested in people in general and filmmakers, and I love music and I love pop culture and anything you got. I, I, I really love social networking and where it's gone, at least for me. I admit that I'm not, I have a Twitter account, which is also my name, uh, Tammy Sutton, but I got to get better at doing the Twittering business, I'm told. So that's uh, Tammy, T A M M I Sutton, S U T T O N, at Facebook, if you're interested in, in seeing. What Tammy's up to in life and dreams? <laughs> yeah, go through go through my photo albums. I've got tons of them. You'll see I'm a big comic fan. I mean, um, which leads me to my next project I want to talk about. Okay. okay. But before that, real quick, I've got a funny birth certificate story. Um, and this back to the World War II project. You know, I, I think it's important that we get these World War II stories told 
by the guys that are, um, you know, are leaving us. Um, last year, Frank Buckles, who was the last World War One soldier, died. Um, right, yeah, had, I remember that. Yeah, he had a great funny birth certificate story that he told um, Associated Press. It was about him tricking an Army captain that was captain that was demanding to see his birth certificate so that he could join the Army. And he told the, um, the Army captain, he said, look, um, birth certificates weren't issued in Missouri when he was, at the time he was born. The record was in the family Bible, and he said, you don't want me to bring the family Bible down, do you? So with that, they let him in. So, and he well, was also, was, Go ahead. No, no, yeah, go ahead. No, he was also responsible for bringing German soldiers back to, um, to Germany after the war. So we've had lots of um, German POWs in the wars over here. It's a really important story to me. It means a lot to me. And, of course, the writer who um, lived it as a little boy. So it's, it's a really special story. And it's a big departure from my, you know, my fans know me as a horror director, but my, my good friends know me as a film director, and they know how passionate I am about this and that, you know, I've got all kinds of stories I want to tell and do. So um, I'm not sure how much, um, you know, horror I'll be doing after the next five years, but you never know. There's, there's so many great stories. Um, so um, what were you going to ask me? Oh, no, I was just going to – oh, a couple things. Uh, uh, my Saturday show, I had a, a writer who, who writes horror or in that genre – but he doesn't really like to be known as a horror writer, but sometimes we have to get stuck in those genres to sell our products. Um, but, but on the birth certificate thing, I just thought of something. In the redemption movement and the sovereign citizens, you know, they'll tell you that uh, birth certificates were originally used only for slaves. They were used as for slave ownership, you know, when you sell a slave or whatever, uh, buy a slave, you got their birth certificate. And if you look, uh, on your birth certificate in the lower left-hand corner, you're going to need a magnifying glass to see this, but in little tiny letters embedded in there, is, it says a, a banknote from whatever bank. Our birth right. certificates are actually uh, banknotes that, that the American government uh, uh, uses as collateral to, to, to um, borrow money from the Federal Reserve. Yeah. But beyond that, who, who cares about that? <laughs> Well, it's the um, same so, thing. You know, we're owned. The birth certificates, you know, we, once you're birthed and have that certificate, you are an American, you know, you are owned by the government. Same thing when you register your car. <laughs> yeah, well, well, what it is is, is your parents uh, change ownership of you to the government by signing off on that birth certificate. That's how you get your Social Security number. Exactly. <laughs> See, so... Um, Paying attention. Yeah, there we go. So, so what, what were you talking about? Your next project was it in the comic book field, or? Yeah. So, for my comic fans and comic friends, um, I'm a huge comic nut and avid action figure toy collector. Um, been going to Comic Con for years. When it was nothing, have seen it grown into mass hysteria and chaos. Um, oh yeah. The film is called Versus Reality, and it's a novel written by a beautiful, talented Blake Northcott. She's Canadian. I'm really excited. The book's just gone to number one in France and the U.K. for uh, number one superhero book and also in the science fiction graphic novel categories. But um, mm. it's political as well. It deals with an alternate reality where all weapons are outlawed in the U.S. and across the world. And the, it's about, you know, trading safety of the world to a single council who controls all the countries. And... Um, the, the anti-heroes find powers that are triggered by use of designer illegal drugs. But, um, you know, it goes back to the old Ben Frank Franklin sentiment, the quote, I think it's, uh, they who can give up essential liberty to attain little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. So, um, but I'm certainly looking forward to getting down to Comic-Con and talk to fans and friends. And um, the second book in the series is actually um, coming out in June. So that's exciting. And um, the MMA guys, the fighters, are really into the book, too. Um, you have to read to find out why. And uh, But I'm excited. And I'm going to watch my first uh, MMA match this weekend with uh, John Bones Jones versus Rashad Evans for the light heavyweight title. So What is, what is MMA? What is that? MMA. MMA? Yeah. Yeah. So, no, yeah. What is it? It's like the no-holds-barred hardcore fighting. Oh, okay. Yeah, so um, 
So those fans are coming on. The MMA guys are really excited. And I actually met some MMA, I met some inter- German attorneys that do extreme sports, and they're actually into MMA. So <laughs> they're really hey. excited, too. And, and this is like a step above the uh, the extreme boxing, or what is that called? Yeah. No. Yeah. Absolutely. It's definitely extreme. Well, but, uh, well eventually we're going to get to the death matches. Um I'm waiting for that, too. (laughs) Well, in the original Olympic Games, you know, going back, way back, in the original Olympic Games, they had death matches, and the the Uh, fighters would fight naked. Why? Yeah. We're going to go to break in about two minutes, and when we do, we're asking you if you all would hang up and wait about two minutes and then call me back. We're having troubles with stuff, and we want to straighten it out. Okay. Okay. Um, So we'll have a a break in two minutes, and and, uh, if anyone... After they get everything straightened out, if anyone wants to call in, it's uh, 347-688-2902. We have to get the server straightened out before they can do that. Oh, okay. I hear airplanes. That's my uh, neighborhood. Oh, is that you? (laughs) Hey. Hey, Hey, man. Hey, man. Yes, sir. You do what you usually do during your show. You call the auto server and then call Tammy and... Them. If, okay. if, if everybody calls the auto server, we're going to end up right back where we were before. We're, we're in total chaos right now, and I'm just trying to. I'm having a nervous breakdown over here, guys. So uh. <laughs> I can't get anything to route because of the way the calls were formed. Uh, well, uh, Mike's got to call me because he's on a phone. No, no, no I'm on Skype. On a phone. Yeah, I'm, it's a regular Skype. It's a regular Skype. Just drag him oh, in. Okay. Call the auto server. Call Tammy. Call Mike. Call the, and then you're good to go. Then I can right. the phones and everything will start working again. <laughs> okay, Sorry, folks. No problem. Everyone out there has uh, got, got an ear in on our minor technical difficulties, but these things happen in the extremely exciting world of Internet radio. They happen on set, too. <laughs> they happen on set. They happen everywhere, except on Fox News. They, but, but that's because, you know, Satan controls them. Uh, Sean David Morton actually uh, claims that Fox stands for 666. I don't know how the, the numerology works that way, but that's what he keeps talking about. Wow. I was very excited this weekend at Monster Palooza. I met uh, Giorgio Sulakis. Right? Oh, from yeah. a- Ancient Aliens? Yeah. Oh, yeah, you have a photo of him on Facebook. Yeah, I, was, I totally fangirled out on him. I love Ancient Aliens. I watch it all the time. But, I mean, I've traveled most of the world in many of these places. I mean, the Nazca Lines, the, the Egyptian Pyramids. I mean, you just, believe me, once you've seen it, you just, every question comes into your mind and your heart. Like, this is just unreal. Climb Mayan temples. Yeah. I believe a lot of it. I know a lot of it's hype, but it's, it's fun to explore the ideas and concepts. I definitely don't think we're out here in the universe alone. Have you have you heard uh, about those new pyramids they found in uh, Bosnia? I saw something about it, but I didn't really um, check it out yet. I haven't seen anything legit on it. Yeah, well, the the archaeologists working on it claim these these um, pyramids in Bosnia are are upwards to twenty to thirty thousand years old. Oh yeah, I'll check that out. And but you know the, the the Egyptians of course are saying it's a bunch of baloney because that would really hurt their tourist trade on their their uh, pyramids if if there's older pyramids out there. I think there's somewhat like they claim that there's seven pyramids there in Bosnia, and at currently they have no idea who built them other than you know that they're twenty to thirty thousand years old. You know were they built by humans or or you know, extraterrestrial or or Neanderthals or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 it cracks me up when they tell me civilization's only 10,000 years old. I'm like, we already have proof. What are you ta- Come on, let's just fix the history books. Right. You definitely, you know, that, um, we need to fix the American history books. There's so much left out. I mean, when I was in high school in the 80s, they still didn't have Vietnam in the textbooks. Really? Yeah. <laughs> like, come on. We're just we're just gathering off topic here until until the break, so we could uh, realign everything. Fix some uh, technical difficulties. Fix the technical difficulties. 
Um, well, you're doing fine now. I mean, I just I just can't uh, cue you or anything about what's going on. Okay, so we're still we're still hanging up at the break. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Okay. Go with the flow. Go with the flow. <laughs> I'll I'll, I'll plug in my producer. I'll plug in my other show. It's on Saturdays, um, uh, six to eight Eastern time. It's called a, a separate reality. Um, I'm not sure who the guest is going to be. I'm working on, on, on a woman who's a MK Ultra super soldier type. Um, I don't know if you ever heard of these, these people, Tammy. Of course. They, oh, you have? The, yeah. the people who've been uh, mind controlled in MK Ultra and they have, you know, different uh, alternate personalities who are for various different missions. Um, I think the woman I have in mind, I, I think she was also a, a remote viewer for the military. Because, you know, they, they choose people who are um, have uh, strong psychic abilities to, to put into these programs. And they start them off pretty young. You know, they, they start indoctrinating them and training them around five, six, seven years old, which includes torture, uh, sexual abuse, uh, uh, satanic rituals in some cases. But they use the, the torture and the abuse for for the mind to split off so they can create these different personalities that they can embed into their, their psyches. Of course, we have, we have seen movies about that stuff as well. So yeah, um, double negative. And, um, did you see men who stare at goats? Oh yeah. Yeah. The men who stare at goats. That. I'm a huge Clooney <laughs> fan. I think he's hysterical. Um, there's a recent movie, Hannah, which was about a young yeah. woman who was a super soldier. Yeah, that was a fantastic film. That's, that, that girl's an amazing actress. Yeah. Um, what other recent movies touch on that? I mean, of course, Captain America. Yeah, Captain America. Oh, yeah. Um, Wait for Marvel's Avengers. Oh, yeah. Marvel's Avengers. I, I heard... Uh, I actually read a, 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 I guess a copy of a script leaked out. It was Samuel Jackson's copy. Right. Uh, which I don't think it was intentionally, I mean, an accident. They always do that stuff intentionally. But the script I've read, I've heard, is uh, different from, I guess, Josh Whedon had had, had uh, rewritten it. They might have been doing it. And the, you know, things change on set as well. And fan complaints. Um, the Jason Bourne films are all so MK Ultra stuff. Oh, right. Yeah, the, the Jason Bourne films. So, you know, it's, 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 it's logical to to wonder. I mean, there's a, numerous people coming out saying that they were they were super soldiers. It's just it's you have to wonder if some of these people have are just being influenced by the films, or if the films triggering their memories. Right. Uh, a lot of times, these people uh, their memories start returning after an accident, or or when they get a certain age. Or, 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 or they, they go to get some hypnotherapy about one thing, and all of a sudden these other memories start popping up. What about you, Tammy? Do you think you were uh, an MK Ultra trained person? No. You, have a, you don't no, have a secret, working on my secret. own training. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I'm not up to speed on that. And but also, you know, I do have a bad memory. It's like my I. Every year I get older, the less and less I remember about my childhood, where I have friends that remember being born and everything since. So that that kind of shocks me that people have that kind of memory retention. Um, I mean, I try I try not to fill my head with stuff that I'm not actively working on or interested in. So I don't, you know, I don't read fashion magazines. I don't read newspapers. You know, I try to keep my news down and. It gets uh, tempting, though, sometimes I get a lot of the news feed stuff, especially, like, on Facebook. So I just, I'm like, I can't click on that. It's too, it's too far away from what I need to be, my focus. Well, they, they, they you know, they're using the, the news and, and the media outlets as a, a, what people call fear porn. You know, the, all this negativity, uh, you know, Japan is radioactive. Uh, these wars are going to start with Iran any minute. Um, and, so we're on a break, so we'll be back after the break. Awesome. And then hang up.
Thank you for listening to Revolution Radio. We'll be right back after this short break, so stay tuned. Worldwide Internet Radio. Join us here weekdays for our new daytime schedule here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. At 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Deacon John brings you the Libertarian Hour, directly followed by Francis Walsh at 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time with Impact Zone. Immediately following that, it's At This Moment with Angela Black and Peter Petrov. Join us weekdays here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. Wait, do you guys hear that? Wait, do you... Yeah, it's the truth. Yeah, you're listening to the truth here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. I'm the host of the Urban Revolution Show here on Revolution Radio at freedomslips.com. My beautiful co-host is Miss Debbie. Urban Revolution is on Tuesdays from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. On Urban Revolution, we cover issues and topics that are near 